other than Bob, all of you guys have been here before, haven't you? So I don't need to do any introductions. Bob, I'm Michael. It's good to meet you. <laughs> okay. Hey, welcome back. So what we did last week, um, I mean the first week is the first baby steps, basically before Apollo, uh, Sputnik, Mercury, Gemini. Um, then we went to the moon and started talking about the solar system. And today we are going to start with my area, which is planetary science, because it has been a golden age for astronomy, uh, for solar system astronomy in, in the past few years. Uh, then we're going to talk about the shuttle on the station and then what's next. Um, yes, this will be broadcast on our own, our favorite cable television channel. When? Do we know yet? We don't know yet. Will it be on the Facebook page? Let's put it on the Facebook page. We'll all watch the WROK Facebook page. It'll be posted there, post with, post haste, post haste, when we can, uh, when we can watch this. Uh, any questions before we dig on? You know, I like this idea of grabbing book covers and using it for my question page. That's, that's fun. I've enjoyed that. But we've had a pretty good chat, so I think got most of the questions out of the way already, which is good because I have over 1,300 slides today. Not quite, but I had a really hard time narrowing it down today. I, I, there is, there's so much fun stuff I want to talk about. First, a little review of what we did last week. We talked about the race to, uh, to the moon between um, us and the Soviet Union slash the Russians. Um, our lunar lander compared to their lunar lander, yes, both, both were built, but only one of those made it to the moon. That's artwork, by the way, not, not an actual photograph. Uh, their lander never got off the ground because they had the uh, N1 rocket, which whatever goes up comes down hard in their case. Um, explosive results, in fact, their first failure killed over 100 people. Um, we also had our failures, the crew of Apollo 1, um, which I remember quite dramatically when, when that happened. Um, loss in the, uh, the, the fire on, on the pad and a little out of sequence, but uh, also um, nice to remember other people who worked so hard and yet gave their lives. Uh, the crew of Challenger at the top, Columbia at the bottom. And, and I'll make this observation again because I think it's worth noting. Uh, compare uh, the diversity of those crews, uh, the fact that um, we have women in our program, which is not something we did in the 60s and in the 70s. By the way, uh, Saturday is the anniversary of the first woman in space. Her name is Valentina Tereshkova. Valentina flew the third flight after Yuri Gagarin, so that was 1962. She, and then the Russians, they did that completely as a publicity stunt. Uh, then they didn't fly another woman again for 25 years. And the only reason they flew 25 years later is because we started put, recruiting our astronauts. Uh, the good news for us is once we actually recruited astronaut Sally Ride, uh, Shannon Lucid, the rest of her class, and so on, um, we kept with it. Uh, we've had commanders of the space station, the head of the office, have been women. Uh, and I'm going to talk about one of my most favoritist astronauts in a little bit. Uh, we talked about Apollo 8, which uh, the, the first trip, not landing on the moon, but uh, the first time humans left uh, the gravity of Earth to go to another world. And a lot of people in, um, in NASA think that this, not, not Apollo 11, they think this is the gutsiest thing that we ever did because so much of what we did at this point was completely untested. But anyway, around the moon and uh, the first picture of Earthrise and uh, the broadcast on Christmas Eve and the letter of saving 1968. Then, of course, we did land on the moon and did all those wonderful things. And then we stopped because it was expensive. And we were doing this primarily to beat the Russians. It was a political, not a scientific um, goal. And we weren't willing to pay billions and billions of dollars for, for just the science of it. Uh, we did Skylab and the first space station for us. The Russians did space stations as well. And we had the first handshake in space. Um, with the Apollo Soyuz, and this really sets up where we're going today. But before I get into human spaceflight, I want to talk about my stuff. Um, I, yes, I work for, uh, for NASA, but I'm an astronomer. I study planets. I study other worlds. Uh, I'm a fan of the space program. Uh, I, think it's, uh, <laughs> I think it's amazing being alive at this time and, and seeing these first, the first times we're, we're exploring these places. But we're also exploring all these worlds. So I'm going to go through some of what I think some of the highlights are. I'm going to focus on Mars and Pluto, the planet Pluto. 
I don't care what they say. Um, and then I'll just kind of breeze over the others just because, uh, as we were talking about before the presentation, I could spend hours on any one of these planets. And you guys don't want to be here till midnight, probably. Um, one of the gifts of the space program is the fact that we can now see our planet from above. We can see whether systems develop. Um, I would say this picture is almost Photoshop because there's no clouds in Michigan. How'd that happen? You know how rare that is to have no clouds in Michigan, whether it's winter or fall? I can tell that's fall because look in the UP, the orange are the, uh, the trees starting to change color. I don't have the date in front of me, but I'm guessing that's the first week in October. Uh, again, no clouds. Um, but the planet Earth is, as far as we know, truly a special, magical place. From the, uh, the weather we have, which is severe and harsh. And uh, here's a little highlight, taking a picture of a lunar eclipse. That's a lunar eclipse, and we had a thunderstorm coming in. A friend of mine took this. Um, so we go from really harsh and uh, severe, from severe to sublime. These are called noctilucent clouds. These are clouds that are actually caused by meteor showers interacting with our upper atmosphere. And because of climate change, we're actually seeing these further and further south. If after the sunset, you see blue iridescent clouds uh, on the horizon, it's actually, you're looking at meteorite dust. And the temperature inversion, the stratosphere is moving at further south. Where would that photo have been taken? Uh, that one was taken at Kitt Peak. That's the observatory right there. And this one was taken on Old Mission Peninsula, Traverse City. So really a magical, magical planet. Uh, but we're talking about northern lights, we're seeing other things. The biggest challenge we have is not the clouds, although the clouds are horrible in Michigan. In fact, when you guys get back to school, when you, got, when you kids do me a favor, I want you to tell your teachers you met a professor at Cranbrook, and he told you the clouds are evil, evil, bad, evil clouds. Can you say evil, bad, evil clouds? Evil, bad, evil. All of you didn't say evil, bad, evil clouds. I insist. Okay. Evil, bad, evil clouds. <laughs> if I was a farmer, I would think clouds are great. They bring crops and make the grass green, but I'm not a farmer, I'm an astronomer. Clouds are, are a problem. But the bigger problem we have around here is light pollution. Um, this is a map of the world lit up by everybody's lights. Literally, look at the eastern United States. Try to find a dark place to build an observatory. Uh, I think we can all find Michigan on this, right? Well, let's zoom in. And here's the challenge we have. My observatory at Cranbrook is right there. That's Pontiac, that's on between that, that brightest blob there and the T in Detroit. So when I started at uh, Cranbrook, I took a look at the observatory and I thought this is gonna be great because we are a really well-equipped observatory. Uh, and then I actually tried using it and I said, this really yucks. This is yucky, this is horrible because things I could see with the naked eye in a dark sky, the Andromeda Galaxy is one of my most favoritest things. You can see it, it's a galaxy, it's two million light years away, two or 300 billion stars, you can see it with the naked eye, I can't see it through the telescope. The skies are so bright. But turn off those lights, you're not using them, please. First up on planetary science is we did learn a lot about the moon. Um, so while science was not the driving reason for Apollo, we definitely went along for the ride. And we were happy to be in the back seat and get whatever crumbs we could. Uh, I'm gonna start my moon story Earth's moon story by looking at Jupiter. One of the things we have found is that the planets have balance points in their orbit. So as Jupiter goes around, they're called Lagrange points, here and here. And they orbit with it, 60 degrees in front of, 60 degrees behind. It's a place where material can accumulate. And we found that the same thing was happening uh, around Earth. This is the Earth-Sun map. So the sun is down there. This, this, the size of that hole shows the gravitational well. Hey guys, how are you? Got a few handouts there if you'd like and glad to see you. So these are points where stuff can accumulate and L4 and L5 are places where stuff can accumulate, especially in the early solar system where there's a lot of stuff floating around and some of that extra stuff accumulated and accumulated and became big enough. It was actually the size of Mars sitting. We're not sure if it was in front or behind, but at some point it came in. When I was a young man, I was, when I was Lucy's age, I know, the gray in my beard, it was a very, very long time ago. Would you hold Mars for me, Lucy? So when I was a very young man, I was told that the reason that the moon came to be was because the Earth was spinning so fast 
that there was a scar, this scar here that is the Pacific Ocean, which isn't really a scar. It just blobbed out. It spun, you ever, just spun so fast and just like the momentum tore it away. And the moon formed out of that. And that was just wrong on so many different levels. It just didn't sound right. Um, then we found out plate tectonics, et cetera, et cetera. This is not a scar. This is not where the moon came from. Bad theory. Another idea is that the Earth captured the moon. So the moon's wandering around, minding its own business. Uh, I was walking on the moon one day, and then the Earth's gravity captured it, but somehow got it into a perfectly circular orbit. Um, if the moon was a captured object, it would be a really elliptical orbit, like this. And then an orbit right here. But what we now think happened, based on the stuff we found from Apollo, is that some of that stuff accumulated at that L4, L5 point, those Lagrange pronouncing points, and came in a Mars-sized planet, and boom. And the core of this object actually merged with the core of the Earth. The, this was torn apart. The Earth was torn apart. which also explains why the Earth has greater density than the other terrestrial planets, because we really have the core of two planets, two, two, two planets in one. And then for a time, following that series across the top and then lower, that stuff went into orbit around the Earth and accumulated and started forming our moon. The Earth actually for a while had rings. That's the Earth in the background. That's the Earth after it's been pretty thoroughly torn apart and torn inside out. It's a big molten mass. You ever seen the inside of a volcano in a picture? The entire Earth was like that. The entire Earth was one big flaming volcano. Yeah? Would the environment we have today, if the two systems hadn't crashed and created that denser core, mm -hmm. would we see what we see today? That is what I call a uh, a frontier question, that's a fantastic question. Until we find life somewhere else, a second ideal, then we're only guessing. But there's a couple of things. First of all, the Earth's magnetic field protects us from the sun's radiation. I'm going to come to that in a little bit too. Uh, the fact that we have, you know, Mars does not have a magnetic field. Venus has a, has a very weak field. Earth is different, and that might be why. Also, the moon going in orbit around us keeps the Earth from shifting too much. So since they have my plans. Pretend this is the Earth now. I'm, I'm all mixed up. Can we trade? Give me the Earth. Here's the moon. So Mars has a tilt, I'm exaggerating, where it's pretty much straight up and down compared to, the, let's say, the sun is, is over there, and then very tilted. The Earth is at 23 and a half degrees, during the right memory. It's 24 degrees, and pretty solid there because the moon is always there, and it's keeping it from torquing too much. It's acting as a break. So that kept our planet from having excessive ice ages. Um, it, the tides keep mixing things up, to, you know, and mixing up might create uh, the conditions we need to create life. There's a lot of things. If you only found life in one place, and that one place has an exceptional core and a moon, a very large moon compared to its size, which will keep that planet stable, correlation does not mean causation. We don't know if one caused the other, but it is an interesting string of coincidences which is why I call it a frontier question. The answer is, the correct answer is, eh, I don't know, but I like the idea. Olive, is it Olive or Olivia? Olive. Olive, yeah. Okay, here we go. And since I'm doing handouts, Mercury for you. And I have um, Pluto. And I got a baby Earth. And I've run up planets, so there's Rubber Ducky. Aww. Now, <laughs> did I ever review the rules? No laughing, dancing, prancing, wiggling, jiggling, giggling? Yes. I did that? Yes. Okay. No. No. <laughs> You're setting a horrible example. Okay. No giggle snorts, especially. <sighs> so the Earth had rings for a while. And then after the Earth kind of settled down a little bit, and after the Moon settled down a little bit, that's from the Earth, Earth view looking up at the Moon. The Moon, when it first formed, was very close to us. Over time, it started pulling away. We started getting an atmosphere because of our volcanic activity. But look at how big the Moon is compared to the Sun. When we have eclipses now, it's because the Earth, excuse me, the Moon and the Sun are the same relative size in our sky. 
the moon has been pulling away over time. In fact, that's one of the other discoveries of Apollo. One of the experiments we left on is a laser rangefinder. You can shoot lasers at the moon right now at several different landing sites. That laser will bounce back at you and you could time that pulse and you could figure out within three hundredths of a centimeter, my fingers can't get that close. Um, that's three micrometers. Uh, that's the, dis the accuracy. It's pulling away at about two centimeters a year. The moon is this much further away than it was last summer and this much further than last summer. Go back four billion years and it ends up looking going back a slide like that, <laughs> like in your face. But you notice the earth is very dry back at this time. Uh, our water at that point we think, not proven, but we think had to come from comets and asteroids. In fact, a lot of the story of the, of the solar system, everything in the solar system is a story of collisions. The moon was created because of a collision. Saturn's rings we think because of collision. Um, the fact that we have oceans because of collisions, things crashing into other things. So we think that the water that you are drinking when you go home, the, the bath you take when you br or when you brush your teeth, that water used to be part of a comet. You're drinking space water. Cool. In fact, here's a more recent picture. I was taking a picture of sun at a sunset outside of Buckley, uh, which is uh, near Traverse City. Uh, it's called the High Rollaways. And uh, just happened to catch, it was during the Perseid meteor shower, and I was lucky enough to get a, uh, a fireball. So we, this is the Perseid meteor shower right here. This is taken at Cranbrook. Um, this was over the course of an hour. This is all the meteors we saw in an hour. So that was a good night. These are tiny rocks from space hitting our atmosphere. Uh, a meteor shower is small stuff, uh, pebbles. This may be up to the size of a, of a grain of sand or a pea, but it's coming in at 30 to 50,000 miles per hour. So when it vaporizes, energy is not only mass, but the speed involved. Uh, that amount of energy turns into a pretty bright flash for a pea. But there's bigger stuff out there. Uh, this is one of our jokes at NASA. Uh, why are the dinosaurs extinct? Because they didn't have a space program. Asteroids are the one natural disaster that are completely preventable. We can take a look at the moon, and boy, can you see the craters? It has been pummeled. And even these really large guys, those are craters of a different type. Something that was so huge, bigger than mountain size, going through, and it actually went through the crust. It punched through the crust, and this is lava that welled up, flooding these areas. So those were titanic impacts. And we use the moon now to date other events in the solar system. We can count if there are craters inside the craters, then we can tell that what surface is newer and older. See how many, there's a lot of craters here and there's fewer here, newer surface, older surface. We assume the moon has been hit at roughly the same pace in every direction. If there's more craters in one area, that means that surface has to be more original, more, um, more uh, unchanged, where this has been resurfaced, repaved, and then some new stuff has come in. By the way, Apollo 11 landed right about there. How's this for an impact? This is the crater Tico. And it hit so hard that it actually splashed rays that you can see. They actually wrap around to the other side of the moon. Was the Earth hit? Oh no, there goes Mercury. Was the Earth hit as much as the moon in our history? I think so. You would think so. In fact, you might even think more because we're a bigger target. We got more gravity. We would, we would suck more stuff in. Uh, but yet the Earth doesn't have cratering like this. In fact, here's another, there's a geological map of the moon, and these circles are just to show the size of the impact basin. Uh, so this is just highlighting different types of geology on the moon. So on Earth, you have to look hard to find craters. Uh, this is Meteor Crater in Arizona. I was flying back from Los Angeles. Uh, so I was looking out the window, say, boom, there it is. Um, and Africa. Australia, but you got to look, we know of 150, last time I looked, it might be more than that by now, about 150-ish craters around the world. Why aren't there as many craters on Earth? What happened to our craters? If we were hit as much as the moon, where did our craters go? Land, yeah, the Earth is a dynamic place. Water, oh, we have continents that rip apart and slam together. We have mountains that are being built like the Rockies. We have mountains like the Appalachians that have been washed away. Um, we have oceans that rise and set. This used to be an ocean right here. That's why you can find Petoskey stones along our beaches. That's coral. 
that used to be in a warm sea. There used to be a warm sea, like a Caribbean. Would have been a great vacation spot some hundred million years ago or so. I don't know how long ago, but that's what this was like back, back then. So yeah, uh, we go to study other worlds so we can understand our own better because a lot of our history has been erased. But here is one of the things that we discovered. This was an impact that happened 63 million years ago. This is Chicxulub in uh, Mexico, uh, in uh, the Yucatan. Came crashing in and uh, it actually sprayed material clear across what is now the United States. We can find pieces of Mexico up here and caused a fireball that pretty well wrapped around the planet. We can see the scorch damage all the way around the world. Now, what big event was associated with this? Yeah. The death of the dinosaurs? Yeah, the extinction of most of the dinosaurs. We really miss them. <laughs> Although, um, that owl that you're wearing on your shirt, that is an owl, right? Uh, that's a dinosaur. Nice. Birds are descended from dinosaurs. So we didn't kill everything. Not only didn't kill dinosaurs, we kind of kept the mammals along, which is great. I'm kind of fond of mammals myself. Uh, but the dinosaurs never saw it coming. Me change never. Look at these teeth. I'm going to live forever, man. But then when they saw it coming, they were very brave. Save yourself, mammal. We will fend off the asteroids with these tiny little arms, I guess. The story of our solar system is a story of collisions. It is a dynamic uh, place with lots of stuff happening. The good news is we found most of these. I worry about comets that come screaming in from the outer solar system. I'll talk about comets in a little bit. But we don't think there's any more dinosaur killers out there. But if there were, we now have space programs that can build rockets and go out there and can deal with this. It takes three things to save the Earth from a comet or an asteroid. If it's a really big dinosaur killer, it takes three things. You need to have three things. You need to have enough time. You need to have enough time. You really need to have enough time. If you can find this thing decades in advance of when it's going to come hit us, and we predict where planets are decades from now, uh, then you have enough time to start gently nudging it over years. Um, you don't want to find something that's going to happen in three months because then you get Bruce Willis. Yeah. By the way, I hated that movie. Armageddon, oh, oh, hated that movie. Anyway, it, it's a problem when you know too much about the science and you just groan every time you see it. So here's a guy that passed a couple of years ago. It was not a dinosaur killer, but um, it, it would have messed up uh, a small town if it had landed near people, kind of like Chelyabinsk did a couple of years ago. And uh, this is how close it went by the Earth, uh, the moon's orbit on the outer circle. In fact, it actually passed. Here's an animation of how close it came. And then it kind of resumed. Whoa, it's close. Whoa. That was close. <laughs> Here's the same animation, but with our satellite. This is the GPS satellite grid. Now, maybe this is a little bit too NASCAR. I was actually hoping to take a satellite out, but that was crude on my part. I know it was, but it would have been fun. But these are the actual discovery. This is why we have animations, is because the real discovery pictures are, OK, that's nice. There's this street going across. That's why we jazz our stuff up with animations. But never date a scientist for this reason. Kiss me. Let me taste your sweet lips once more before the asteroid destroys the Earth. No, she corrects him. Technically, that's a meteor. Asteroids are in space. Meteors throwing through their atmosphere. So let's talk about the solar system. And uh, we'll go right to the yoke of the matter and deal with the, I'll kind of start there and work my way out. This chart shows all the missions we have sent out in the solar system. If we had done this when I was Lucy's age, it would have been just this inner circle to the moon, and that was it. But we have sent missions to the sun, uh, Mercury, Venus, uh, Mars, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, still a planet, and even beyond Pluto. These are all the missions that are extant right now in our solar system. There's a little over, last I counted, a little over 100 science missions exploring the solar system right now. So all of these are active. Uh, just the US or also? The, all the world. All the world. We're scientists. We're, we're, we, anybody wants to put it up, we'll, we'll take data from anybody. Uh, I would say that two-thirds of it's the US. 
we, we have a space program that is, e that is equaled by none uh, when it comes to planetary science. And yet, it's one half of 1% of the federal budget. Quite a value, I would say, for exploring other worlds. Uh, there is a website out there called The Sun is Art. It's on NASA's website. I would, if you're into this stuff at all, I would strongly recommend you go there and just browse through the pictures and the animations. I, I, I picked so many of them to show today, and then I decided, no, I can't show another 100 slides. <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, but the sun is our, is our star. It is, I mean, remember from the first day, how many Earths fit inside the sun? Go ahead and say. A million. A million. Those of you who've seen Austin Powers. Yeah. It's actually 150 million, 147, but I like round numbers, so I'm going to say a million. So if we shrank the entire huge ginormous earth the size of Olive's head, then the sun would be the size of the water tower at the zoo, the difference between a planet and a star. And this gives to scale, that's called a prominence. I mean, you, you could put 10 earths going through that, that archway. These are magnetic storms called sunspots because astronomers are horrible at naming things. They're spots, they're on the sun. Those are cooler areas on the sun. The sun goes through an 11 year cycle of none of these, lots and lots and lots, and then none again. Looks like a roller coaster. And we're just at the bottom right now. If you zoom in on one of these guys, this is what it looks like. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, this blob right here, that little white blob right there, is about the size of North America. So that would make Earth about, oh, about that big. Yeah, right there, about that big. What is, is that like, is it a gas, is it, what is it? Uh, the sun has magnetic fields. You've seen pictures of the Earth's magnetic field, you know, it goes out the North Pole, wraps around. The Earth is solid-ish, our core is liquid, but you know, our, our magnetic field lines are pretty consistent over time. The sun is plasma, it is roiling. So those magnetic field lines are like taking a large rubber band, you twist it, and you twist it, and you twist it, and it forms knots. If you're taking a rubber band, like you're really twisted as far as you can, uh, and then the you start buckling, and these knots start buckling up. That's what that is. Yeah. The magnetic field lines of the sun being buckled up and twisted, and you'll always find sunspots in north and south magnetic poles, because that magnetic flux line is going between them. In fact, that arch I showed, going back, is north and south magnetic poles at either end of that arch. And at the bottom of that, uh, th that magnetism is blocking some of the heat, so it's a thousand degrees cooler than the area surrounding it. Our cameras are calibrated to take an exposure for this stuff, so this stuff doesn't have enough light to be exposed. If we had enough light to expose this, we'd be completely blinded by the stuff around it. So it's like trying to take a picture of, on a bright sunny day, something really deep in the bushes. You, know, you, you can't, there's a cute bunny, but I can't get a good picture of it because my camera's seeing the super bright day. Don't drop the Earth. It's my favorite planet, I'm very attached. But I'm bummed. So we photographed the sun in various wavelengths of light. Uh, like going to the doctor's office, x-rays, MRIs, the doctor got a lot of different ways of looking at you. We have different ways of looking at the sun. So we have a better understanding of what's going on. I like this picture because it's a smiley face. Do you see it? Eyeball, eyeball, big smile. No laughing. No. Lucy. What's her middle name? Lucinda Elizabeth. Lucy Liz, no, 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 Lucy Liz. And I just got, I could spend days on all these things. But it's, it's good to think of the fact that we live in the sun's atmosphere. We think about space being a vacuum. It isn't. It's close, but the sun sends off tons of charged particles. Those charged particles race through the solar system. They interact with our magnetic field. And our magnetic field then channels this stuff into the north and south magnetic poles. And when it does, we get northern lights. You're talking about. So the question was, when can you see the northern lights? 
Go to a website called spaceweather.com. One word, spaceweather.com. Tony Phillips is a friend of mine. He's at NASA Goddard. This is his personal project. This is updated every hour, and it shows where the northern lights are currently visible. So not Scotland, but yes, Iceland, Greenland, most of uh, Canada except uh, Ontario. Uh, not us, but the UP on the edge. Minnesota, if you're far enough north. So those charged particles hit my, our atmosphere if our, our magnetic field, if the magnetic field can't handle the load as a circuit breaker, then a lot of that energy gets channeled in the atmosphere and it becomes like a fluorescent light in the upper atmosphere. And it looks like this. This picture is taken up uh, near Sleeping Bear Dunes. We can see the, uh, the northern lights up here. Uh, and I'm sorry, we can see the, the Milky Way up here and the northern lights. It's a place called Otter Creek that, that we really like, just south of Empire, uh, if you ever get up that way. Nice place. So we live in our sun's atmosphere. We're, our, the reason we study the sun so carefully is because all life on Earth, pretty much, pretty much all life on Earth is absolutely dependent upon the sun. So it's kind of good to know <laughs> how it's doing. Oh, I'm going to fly through planets. Uh, Mercury is next on my list. We had a mission that flew in 1974 called Mariner 10. This is one of the reasons why I became a planetary astronomer. Mariner 10 flew past Mercury three times. Mercury is small, and it's very close to the sun. It's close enough to the sun. It's really hard with Earth-based telescopes to get a look at it. Go outside. Try to see the stars during the daytime because it's right next to the sun. You can't. Seeing Mercury during the daytime is very hard. We didn't have any good pictures of Mercury. We didn't even understand how Mercury rotated. We thought that Mercury was tidally locked, meaning that the, one side, the same side of Mercury faced the sun at all times, kind of like the moon is tidally locked to the Earth. We always had the same side. And what we found is that it's not the case. Mariner 10 flew past Mercury three times. It flew past the same side three times. <laughs> it flew into the inner solar system, flew past Mercury, came back two months later, flew past Mercury, came back two months later, flew past Mercury a third time, and then it no longer worked. Um, it, it fried the electronics that close to the sun. So I have a map of Mercury. This is half of Mercury. You can see how much of it is missing. But we expected, after flying over three times, we would have a full map. I've got a full-size poster for the US Geological Survey that is 50% blank. You might as well write in there, uh, terra incognita, here be dragons. And it irritated the 12-year-old me saying, here's a planet we don't know half of. We didn't even know how it turns until we went there. And I lived with that frustration for ages until we sent a mission called Messenger. And we got the, the full picture. Um, and now I have a map of all of Mercury, including the geology of Mercury. These are all shrinkage lines. So some of us older people might have stretch marks. That's kind of the same thing. Um, moving on far too quickly for a place that I find fascinating, but Venus. Uh, anybody here have an evil sister or evil brother? <laughs> Lucy Liz, who could it possibly be? Do, do tell me. You've got another brother or sister, right, Olive? No? Okay. I'm, I guess I can figure who Lucy Liz is picking on here. Venus is Earth's evil twin. Venus is the closest thing to hell that we know of. Mercury is far closer to the sun than the Earth is, but yet Mercury... Uh, excuse me, Venus is much hotter. Uh, the atmosphere on Venus is crushing. It's 200 times thicker, 100 times thicker than Earth's atmosphere. So if you took the United States Navy's best nuclear submarine and you put it on the surface of Venus, it'd be crushed like a tin can. Something that can handle the depths of the o Earth's oceans could not handle the atmosphere of Venus. It is, the pressure is so intense. But wait. There's more. The atmosphere is made out of greenhouse gases, primarily carbon dioxide. In fact, it was studying Venus that helped us understand our own greenhouse gas, our own climate change problems here that much better. Uh, the temperatures on Venus are hot enough to melt lead. But wait, there's more. The atmosphere is also rife with sulfuric acid. So when you land a spacecraft on Venus and the Soviet slash Russians have three times I can think of uh, by memory, they've had, they put three working probes into this hellhole of a planet. And they worked for half an hour each on average, which is impressive. And there were bets being taken, would it be crushed first, or would it have a heat death, or would the sulfuric acid burn its way through the hull? Take your pick. 
bets are being taken now. And uh, very impressive program. Uh, the, the Soviets, the Russians have had horrible luck at landing on Mars. They have failed and failed and failed again, but they have definitely succeeded on landing in Venus. Uh, when I was Olivia's age, uh, Olive's age, excuse me, I'm sorry, Olive's age, a uh, very, very long time ago, I was, because Venus is covered with such thick cloud cover, we didn't know what Venus looked like. Um, it was a mystery. We just thought, oh, it's clouds, so it must be really humid and hot. Uh, it's covered with swamps and has dinosaurs. Sure, why not? Yeah. You know, if you have no data, you can make up anything you want. That is an axiom in science. And wait till we get to Mars. Ah, speaking of which, moving on to Mars. And I'm going to spend a little more time on Mars because I think we have some interesting stories about Mars. Uh, Mars is a place now where it started off with canals. <laughs> when I was a young man, I was told that, yeah, we've got canals on Mars, and we can see uh, the northern and southern hemispheres get greener during sp in sp its spring and fall, and, and then during its winter, it loses that green. So you can kind of get an idea of that tinting here. So that shows that there must be seasons and plants, maybe. You know, if you only look at your tiny dot, and I would love to show you how small Mercury, excuse me, how small Mars is through a telescope. Uh, again, with a lack of real data, you can make up anything, any kind of story you want. And if there's nothing to prove or disprove it, then you go with the story. Uh, on the left-hand side, that's a Hubble image matched up to the the idea of canals. So underlying this diagram, those lines were made by Schiaparelli um, back 150 years ago, but the real details like Hellas Basin and that stuff is crossed over. So you can see if any of this stuff lines up, and a lot of the stuff doesn't even really line up. <laughs> yeah, Hellas Basin has, uh, Schiaparelli put something there that matches up that, but what the heck? <laughs> Was he looking at these things? Uh, Here's a really bright object that he didn't, yeah, we don't know. It's a challenge looking through Earth's atmosphere. It, it's really dancing around. But Mars is a place now. These are ginormous volcanoes over here. By ginormous, I mean this one right here is about as big as the entire state of Michigan. And it's not the biggest one. Uh, Olympus Mons is a little further along. This is a ginormous canyon. The Grand Canyon would be as big as that little bit right there. Anybody here been to the Grand Canyon? So imagine something that's a, something deeper than the Grand Canyon as wide as the entire United States. Impressive features. So we've been in orbit to take these pictures, and then we have landed on Mars. This is the Viking landers that landed in the bicentennial. Fourth of July, 1976. Good way to celebrate uh, the nation's uh, birthday, and uh, 200th birthday. Uh, even on more recent missions, this was the, uh, this is the Phoenix lander at uh, Land of Memorial Day uh, a couple years ago. And NASA invited people to send their names and a message to Mars. That's what that disk is right there. That's a, a CD or DVD or some such. And you're, there's several hundred million messages from people around the world. We're now collecting messages for Mars 2020. So if you'd like to send a message to Mars, go to nasa.gov, do a little search for Mars message and you'll be taken to the site on the Jet Propulsion Lab where you can put a message, and we'll put it on a disk for you, and we will send it to another world. But landing is nice, but the problem with a lander is you're stuck. You've got a robotic arm or something, and there's something really cool, just, oh, I can't get it, which gets the idea of rovers. We loves our rovers. We started with this little guy. And uh, that's, um, that's like the size of a wagon, a wagon that uh, might pull around the grandkids. Then we got to something a little bigger. Where that was a photograph, this is an artistic rendering, uh, Spirit and Opportunity, the Mars rovers. And we haven't sent people to Mars yet. We will someday. But as some, I work for JPL. I'm at the Jet Propulsion Lab, the people who build these things. You want a robot to go somewhere? <laughs> JPL. That's who you go to to build this stuff. And we live vicariously through our robots. For example, up top here, we've got two cameras on top of a mast. This is six feet high, two meters actually, and spaced about as far apart as your eyeballs. So when we take pictures with that stereoscopic camera, it's like you're standing there. And you're seeing it with, your, with the same perspective as if the geologist is there. 
This is an arm that's about the same size as a human arm, shoulder, elbow, and wrist. And you get the idea that at that point, if it's the same size, you're going to well, I want to reach out and, and do an experiment on this rock over here. And it's got a drill on the front of it so you can uh, get inside the rock and find out what's going on. That robotic arm was built by a company called Honeybee Robotics, who is in Brooklyn, New York. And something they didn't tell people until after this mission had been on Mars for a year is the aluminum they used to build that robotic arm, just this part right here, was built from materials they salvaged from the World Trade Center. This is a little bit of New York, a little bit of American history, repurposed. And yeah, it was very touching. These are very personal projects for us. This is the stuff that we do. We live vicariously through our robots as they drive around. So this is looking, this is an actual photograph looking back over the, the, uh, the solar panels, and you can see the track that we came in on. Uh, these missions were only supposed to last for 90 days. We launched two of them because we we're pretty sure one was going to fail. But they kept going and going. The Energizer, Energizer Bunny has nothing on these guys. This picture is very telling. Uh, opportunity towards the end of its life. Um, look at the difference in these two tracks. This is one set of wheels here and another set of wheels here. One of the wheels on the front of the rover actually froze. The, the soil on Mars, the regolith, is very, um, it's like ground glass, much like the moon. And it gets into motors and joints, and it just wrecks them. So that wheel stopped working on the front right side. So what they started doing is driving backwards, dragging it behind them. Yes, master, I'm coming. I'm coming, master. And it did that for another couple of years. <laughs> Do you see how the tread changes here? That's, um, uh, they actually put some holes in the wheel. The wheel's made of aluminum, so as they turn it, it leaves these marks. So they can actually see how far they've traveled. But that right there is Morse code for JPL. JPL, 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 over and over and over and over again. The Jet Propulsion Lab. JPL is a part of NASA. We call ourselves the Pirates of NASA. We have a real pirate attitude. And we always try to sneak in our, our logo somewhere. And NASA always tries to take it back out. Not, they don't try really hard, but it's sneaky. This is one of the last pictures taken by Opportunity overlooking a valley. Um, and it, it's very Earth-like. If you've been to Arizona, the high desert, uh, it's bluish in there because we're heading towards sunset. You can see how long the shadows are here. Um, and it just kept going and going. In fact, the missions were supposed to last for 90 days. Spirit lasted for six years. Opportunity lasted for 14. 14 years out of its three-month mission. And they were just amazing machines. But wait, there's more. We did better. And that is, the, uh, we followed that with the Mars Science Lab, which we named Curiosity. And Curiosity is nuclear-powered, laser-equipped. This is a picture of it landing, taken by an orbiter, a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So there's a photograph of it, and there's a blow-up. So there's the parachute, and there's the, uh, the mission itself. And uh, I'll show you the size in a minute, but this is an actual photograph. It took that robotic arm it has and took 50-some images, and we stitched them all together. Uh, talk about a selfie stick. And that's what it looks like. And this is the size of a car. And its job is to climb that mountain, which is it's been doing. It's been finding in this area here a lot of evidence of past water. In fact, these are clay beds, sedimentary beds. So Mars has Mars used to be warm and moist. And did it have life? I don't know. But I've got a $50 bet with a colleague that will find proof of life. But I didn't bet $100 because Mars is a tease. But this is the size comparison of the three rovers. Opportunity and uh, Spirit over here and Curiosity and Sojourner over there. And uh, in the background, see the different areas here? This is the, uh, there's a special name, Mars Yard. See, so I'm going to do that once again. Pete Conrad, Mars Yard. <laughs> I'm going to have running one glitch per, per presentation. We built a, uh, a yard at JPL. Um, 
JPL, by the way, is part of Caltech, Pasadena, California Institute of Technology. And so we could test driving these guys on different surfaces. So we could see what it would take for them to get stuck. And so we can avoid those areas or better engineer them to, to deal with those. So that's why they're in that uh, funky looking places. This is like the dune buggy track. Um, perhaps this gives you a better idea of sense of scale. Uh, our three rovers plus uh, the, Mar the moon rover from the Russians, the Soviets, Lunokhod, which is on the moon the same time as the astronauts were driving around. So yeah, curiosity is pretty big. By the way, the, the moon rover, I failed to mention this last week, made by GM. GM, Ford, and Chrysler all had big parts in the space program. Uh, Ford had, at that point, a, um, a subsidiary called Philco, Philco Ford, which built radio equipment. They actually built the cameras uh, and the microphones that uh, Trent and Neil transmitted back on. Um, Chrysler built rockets, like the Redstone that carried Al Shepard. That rocket was built at uh, 17 Mile and uh, Van Dyke and was carried by train oh all the way down to Florida. So there was a rover called, uh, not a rover, excuse me, a lander called Phoenix landed in the North Pole. Actually, it was a, a back home mission. Uh, that's a friend of mine. His name is Don Bott. He built that robotic arm. He's the last person to touch it before it was put away. And then this is an artistic rendering of what it, his device. So can you imagine building something you know is going to go on another world that has never been touched by human hand again unless yes. we go there someday and say, hey, Look what they left over here. Yeah, let's uh, change the batteries and uh, maybe change the spark plugs and see if we can fire it up again. So Mars is a place. It is our destiny to go there someday. Uh, I personally don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. But if uh, the politicians want to pay for it, I'd be happy to cheer them on. Beyond Mars, we get into uh, asteroids and comets. We have actually landed on these things. That's Halley's Comet right there. We've had several missions. Um, this is Comet 67 p Churyumov grasimenko which is what I prefer to call the cosmic space ducky, because it actually kind of looks like a rubber ducky. Uh, the Dawn mission flew past uh, uh, Ceres, and actually orbited Ceres and Vesta. And this is a picture of uh, Vesta right here. Boy, story of impacts. I'm going to ask you to think like scientists for a minute, kids. So I want you to take a look at that image. This is, this, this is the data. These are the facts. You, you're sitting at mission control, and this picture shows up on the screen. And then some reporter says, hey, Mr. Scientist, sir, what do you think caused this stuff? What do you think caused these ridges here, guys? Hypothesize. Think like a scientist. What could cause stuff like that? What do you think? Yeah, you don't have to raise your hand. Throw it out. Uh, presumably, like, seismic activity. Seismic, yeah. Kind of small, though, to have uh, volcanoes and earthquakes. That's a good idea. Collisions? Ah, yes. I was going to borrow this. <laughs> So Vesta's floating through space, minding its own business, just la di da 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 all of a sudden, bam! Something slams into it right here. And it's just like the front of a car. Have you seen a car after a wreck? It's kind of accordioned up. Literally, something slammed. You can see how broken it is here. Something slammed in here and just crunched it up. Good catch. No. Giggling. Lucy Lee's. In fact, we find pieces of Vesta now. A lot of people collect meteorites. And because we've been there, we have tested this spectroscopically. We know what Vesta is like. We have its chemical fingerprint. It is different from everything else. We have found bits of these collision in Earth meteorites. We have pieces of Vesta at Cranbrook that I've held in my hand <laughs> that were a chip off the old block. Oh, but moving on, uh, Jupiter. And to give you a sense of scale, you should, I got a picture of this and also Saturn like my favorites. This is called an occultation. So in the foreground, that's Earth's moon. In the background is Jupiter. Jupiter is big enough, it's a thousand times as big as the Earth. And I think I gave the example in the first day, if we made the Earth this big, then Jupiter would go from ceiling to floor, but not the floor here, but the floor underneath us. That's how big Jupiter is. But Jupiter is half a billion miles away, 500 million miles away. 
So the moon, much smaller but much, much closer, occasionally crosses in front of it. So that's a picture of what it looked like going in and what it looked like coming out the other side. And I think you're going to have a hard time seeing it there, but here's a couple of Jupiter's large moons right there and there. I'd have to look up to see which, are, which ones they are. I would guess Europa and Ganymede. But those are pictures taken at Cranbrook. This is an example of how big Earth is compared to, uh, to Jupiter. This right here is a storm, and I can tell you two wild facts about this storm. It's called the Great Red Spot because astronomers are horrible at naming things. It's big, it's red. What are we going to call it, Bob? The, red the big Great Red Spot. It's really great. That storm, it's a hurricane that's been going for at least 400 years. I say at least 400 years because the first telescopes were invented by Galileo and friends 400 years ago, and they saw it there. But it might be 400, 4,000, 4 million. It's a perpetual hurricane, and we don't know why it keeps going and going. Although, we're now starting to see it fall apart a little bit. Come to Cranbrook, I'll show it to you. The second wild fact is the size. You can fit the Earth and Venus and Mercury and Mars and Pluto. Pluto's like jello. There's always room for Pluto. Would all fit inside that storm. It's huge. So let's talk about planet sizes just a little bit. So I've arranged this diagram just on size. And I'm going to make a minority case as to why I think most astronomers are wrong. <laughs> so you should know right up front, you should probably doubt what I'm about to say. But let's see if I can make my case. We have this argument, what are moons, what are planets, and what are planets? What are dwarf planets? Or Dr. Forster, Dr. Forster, it, Pluto's not a planet anymore. I get that. I hate that. It still is, yes. So Earth, planet or planet? Planet. planet. Venus? Planet. Mars? Planet. Ganymede, largest moon in the solar system? No, why not? It's bigger than Mercury. Titan, bigger than Mercury. because it is an orb around somebody else. And this is what I have a, the problem with. Nowhere else in science do we exclude things because they really aren't where they should be. We don't say that, I'm sorry, dolphins, whales, you're not mammals, because you're in the wrong place. Even though you're big enough and you have all the other qualifications, you bear your young life, you nurse them, you, 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 you look like mammals in every other sense, except proper mammals don't live in the sea. <laughs> they live on land. Uh, I'm not even going to get started on bats. Penguins, I'm sorry, penguins, you're not birds. You live in the ocean, and then you live on land. No proper bird lives in the ocean for months on end. So the argument is that you have to orbit around the sun or a different star to be a planet. If you orbit around a different planet, then you are a moon. But as a planetary astronomer, when I look at I look at Ganymede and Titan and these other guys the same way I look at Earth, Mars, Venus, Mercury. As a planetary astronomer, this is as interesting as this. And other than the fact of where they are, I see no reason why they shouldn't be planets as well. All the way down to this guy. As far as I'm concerned, and again, minority opinion, most astronomers disagree with me. They're wrong. I'm right. But most of them disagree. As far as I'm concerned, if it's spherical, it should probably be a planet. That means that there's enough gravity. The fancy term for that is hydrostatic equilibrium. Enough gravity to suck it all in so it looks like a circle. Vesta, you remember Vesta looked like a potato? That would not be a planet. And we get down to these really small guys down here. But, 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 Dr. Forster, that's too many planets. We can't ask our children to memorize all the planets if there's too many of them. We don't ask our children to memorize the names of every mountain on Earth. Why do we expect them to only memorize just, I'm sorry, eight planets? Because nine was too many. We're going to stop at eight now. Yeah. Minority opinion, though. In fact, talking about how interesting these places are, uh, these blue spheres are how much water we think each of these bodies have. If we took all the Earth's oceans and glaciers and snow and we, lakes and we put them all together, that's how much water the Earth has. Europa has twice as much water as all the Earth's oceans combined. And that water is liquid under an ice cap. It's like the North Pole. And we would love to send a submarine there to go explore there, because there, I think there's a good chance that we'll find life there. If we're going to find life anywhere in the solar system, a warm ocean 
Looks like the kind of place that would be very interesting. That's where I want to send the yellow submarine. Yeah, it should be yellow. Yeah. But moving on because lots to talk about, not, not enough time. Talking about the story of impacts, which is today's overarching theme. This is a comet that uh, was discovered by a friend of mine, David Levy, as well as um, Gene and Carolyn Shoemaker. David's a friend of mine, and Gene and Carolyn I unfortunately have not yet met. Uh, but they saw this comet break apart. The comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, the ninth comet that they discovered. David's found 30 comets so far. Um, this comet broke apart when it passed Jupiter, broke, breaking into a, a huge chain of other comets, fragments. He called it a string of pearls. And what was really exciting, you saw, it, once it passed Jupiter and broke up, it was going to go back and crash into Jupiter over and over and over and over again, leaving these huge scars. Hey, remember the great red spot? As big as Earth, Venus, Mercury, Mars, and Pluto together. Look how big these scars are. These are pictures from Hubble. David Levy used to go to Congress and said, you know, we really should have part of our space space program, just a tiny bit, finding comets and asteroids and coming up with a plan so if it's coming our way, we might be able to do something about it. And he was laughed at. That's ridiculous. Until he could take in pictures from Hubble. Look. Thump. It happens. We see it happen. It was Jupiter last time. It could be us next time. Um, although Jupiter's got a lot more gravity, it's more likely. How are you doing? Uh, I took one of those. Uh, scars off of Jupiter and I superimposed it on the Earth just to give you a sense of scale. Not that, it, that an impact would look like that at all, but just to give you an idea just how big those impacts were. And Jupiter is a gas giant planet and yet those scars persisted for weeks. So it was, <laughs> it was a mess. Moving on, Saturn. Talking about places that we've explored, and yes, it's really nice to see this again, another occultation, Moon in the foreground, Saturn in the background. Saturn is twice as far as Jupiter. So Saturn in that picture is a billion miles away. A billion miles. And I showed this in the first session, my favorite astronomy picture of all time, and there's us. Love that picture. But we've explored Saturn with a number of missions. The most recent was called Cassini. That's the size of a school bus. And one of the things it found was a moon called Enceladus that actually has geysers. There are warm water geysers like, think Yellowstone. There's another ocean here that warm water ocean that's venting into space. And the next time we go to Saturn, we want to actually take a Cassini-like mission and fly through that geyser. Instead of trying to land, landing is hard, but we can do flybys pretty easily and sample it and see if maybe there's something swimming in it. And yes, I'm going to cruise by. Nobody really spends a lot of time talking about Uranus and Neptune, and I'm not either, because eh, time, time constraints. Uh, but they're like 100 times the size of the Earth, and they're in interesting places. And we've only been there once, Voyager 2 went there. But poor Pluto. Poor, poor Pluto. Pluto got yanked from the club. There's people like me who are saying, no, we, uh, we're, we're going to fight the system on this one. And if you actually uh, check with uh, people who work at NASA, the people actually build robots, explore other worlds. We still think of Pluto as a planet, minority opinion. Pluto is a tiny little place. This is a picture taken at Cranbrook. Pluto is in between those two lines. That's Pluto right there, in between those two lines. I took that picture uh, when Pluto was in front of this dark cloud in space, Bernard 92, because it would stand out a little bit better. Pluto is now, if you come to Cranbrook next week, I'll show you Pluto's over here. <laughs> it's a little harder to find where is Pluto amongst all the other stars as compared to when it's standing out better. Yeah? So Pluto was officially renamed Nope. The International Astronomical Union calls it a dwarf planet and do not include it on the list of planets. Which is funny because in astronomy, dwarf stars are still stars. Dwarf, dwarf galaxies are still galaxies. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, a chihuahua is still a dog and Pluto is still a planet. Uh, this is the best pictures we had of Hubble until we went there because it's 4 billion miles away and it's tiny. And it's way out there where it's really dark, so it's hard to see. We found that Pluto has five moons How many moon, that we know of. How many moons do we have? One. One. Yeah, Pluto wins. And then we decided, let's go there. 
So we flew the New Horizons mission past it. It is the fastest thing NASA's ever launched. And yet it took nine years to get to Pluto. Almost 10 years. A few months short of 10 years. The fastest thing NASA's ever launched, it took almost 10 years to get to Pluto. And what we found when we got there is we found that Pluto is a planet with a big heart. And I mean that literally because right there, it has this feature that looks like a great big heart. That's a giant moon Charon in the background. So this is the flyby. Not only did it take nine and a half, call it ten years to get there, and they flew in such a way that the sun would be eclipsed right behind so we can get a look at its atmosphere, uh, but they also did it on the 50th anniversary when we first flew past Mars. That's just showing off. I mean that's rocket science showing off. I'm going to show that again. We're going to see coming up on Pluto. This is the problem with the flybys. You got one opportunity, man. You hope everything works. And then we're going to see its giant moon Charon in the background there. And then we flew through Charon's uh, shadow as well. And then the sun backlit so we can see its atmosphere. That was, that was an amazing trip. And uh, this is a glacier. And it's again, we find these places that are very similar and very alien. We see these mountain ranges, like in here and over in here. And then we see glaciers. We have glaciers and mountains on Earth, except the mountains are made out of water, water ice. It is so cold that the water is as hard as granite. And the glaciers are made out of nitrogen. So we're breathing nitrogen right now. Imagine how cold does it have to get before this turns from air to frozen nitrogen, cold. Same as for Europa and Io and the other places, tidal flexing. So uh, the orbit of Enceladus is not perfectly circular. There are times where it's closer to Saturn and further away. It's being flexed. So it's like taking a paper clip or another piece of metal and you bend it and you bend it and then it physically gets hot. That is the energy source, simple flexing of the crust and the core that is providing the heat. Yes, owl girl. Um, most of the dry ice you're going to find is made out of uh, carbon dioxide. And I've worked in a few labs that had liquid nitrogen, but that's laboratory grade stuff. So you can get dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide at Hollywood, I think, if you ever want to do any mad evil experiments. Yeah? If, if Pluto is not a planet, how can it have moons? Uh, there are asteroids that have moons. Uh, we have a European Space Agency mission, European Space Agency and NASA combination called DART, and it's one is going to orbit, the other part is going to impact. Uh, the asteroid is called uh, Didymos, after a Greek goddess. Its moon is called Didymoon. And we're going to crash into that moon to, to experiment. If we need to move an asteroid, how hard do you have to hit it? What is it like? When, is it just a gravel pile and just like disappear? or is actually change orbit, but we're doing it around a moon so that no matter how hard we hit it, it's not going to fly off into space and hit us. <laughs> the major body still controls it, even if it turns into a gravel pile. So yeah, there are moons of moons. And uh, New Horizons kept going, and one of the things that flew past, uh, this is New Year's Day this year. It's called Ultima Thule. It is the furthest thing we've flown past, and I've got a little model of... Ultima Thule, which to me looks like a snowman. Uh, that's called a Kuiper Belt object, um, and this is stuff that's original to the birth of the solar system. So we're seeing stuff that's been in the back of the freezer for the vast four and a half billion years. So it's like finding that piece of wedding cake from the 30th wedding anniversary. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't eat it, but on the other hand, I might tell you something scientifically. Um, I would say that the second coolest thing NASA's ever done is called Voyager. First is landing on the moon, Apollo, boom for the win. But the second coolest thing we've done is a mission called Voyager. Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. They were launched in uh, 1978. Jimmy Carter was president. Their storage, is, their computer storage is 8-track tape. For those who have, 
it's space hardened. Uh, it's not like the RAM memory you have in your, your phones and computers. It, it's eight tracks. Uh, that was the cutting edge technology at the time. They flew past Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Voyager 2 went on to Uranus and Neptune. Voyager 1 headed for the outer solar system. It is our first interstellar probe. These guys have now left. I talk about the solar wind. That solar wind fills the solar system until it hits the solar wind from all the other stars. That's called the heliopause. And when it reaches that point, that's my definition of where the edge of the solar system is. There's still comets beyond this. They're still part of uh, uh, the sun's orbit, and those comets come screaming in. Those are like islands off of the coast. If you're going to say, where's North America? You might say Bermuda. Yeah, it's kind of part, but I'm going to say Miami Beach. This is where the main thing stops, and there's stuff offshore. Well, that's, that's where our shore is there, and Voyager 1 is now in interstellar space. It's our first interstellar probe. It was launched in 1978 uh, as another thing that we didn't think was going to last this long. It's still transmitting home. Every Monday, NASA gives a little call and says, hey, how's it going? It's so far out, it takes 14 hours for the message to get there, and it answers back saying, I'm cold. I want pizza. Can I come home now? <laughs> we don't answer back. That's just, that's just embarrassing. Voyager 2 this uh, last summer also crossed that boundary. So we now have two interstellar probes, and they're still working. And just in case they're ever found by aliens, we've put gold records on them. Huh. Carl Sagan and friends put together the best music of the earth, uh, Johnny B. Good, you know, along with Beethoven and Mozart. He was asked, why didn't you have more Mozart? And he said, it'd be like bragging. You know, you don't want to overdo it. Um, but also scientific description of where we are. Uh, I wanted to unfortunately skip these. I was going to talk about more stuff. I want to get to the space program. Okay. Those are all wonderful. Yes, uh, great universe. I like my universe. Pretty stuff. Stuff goes boom, blah, blah, blah. So what do you do after Apollo? What do you do for a follow-up? We wanted to build a space station. We wanted to build a space shuttle to, uh, to service that station. So here's some, one of the early ideas. In fact, this is actually part of a rocket. So they're just trying to decide how they're going to build this. They decided that they not only needed to build a space station, but also have a platform for launching satellites. This is art. This is not a photograph but the idea of launching uh, things like the Hubble Space Telegraph. The idea of space planes has a long history. This design came uh, uh, back in the 1940s and was developed over time to, uh, to spiff it up a little bit. Um, unfortunately, it was a lot of compromise between what NASA wanted and what the United States military wanted because they wanted this to be the only launch vehicle for the United States. Think about how many different rockets we have now, different companies that have launches. They're going to do everything on one shuttle, all your eggs in one basket. This is the Enterprise, which was a non-space flight version. Uh, and they would carry it on the back of a 747. And they did drop tests to make sure, because NASA tests and tests and tests again. So they would actually release the 747 to go into a dive. And this would go land at Edwards Air Force Base, just to make sure that the system actually worked. How well does it glide, even though it has wings? Uh, astronauts have told me it flies like a brick. A brick with wings, it does not fly well at all. So you get, there's no uh, engines on this thing when it comes in. You get one shot at landing. If you, there's no gunning the engines and going back around and trying again. Anybody here been on an airline that had to redo a landing? It's like, oh, yeah, a little. Now, there are some other ideas that are considered as well, but unfortunately, this one was rejected. This didn't quite work out. So the shuttle uh, rollouts the pad. It has a... Uh, uh, four different components to it on uh, the shuttle orbiter itself, which would go all the way to space and back again. It has two side rockets, the solid rocket boosters. They would fall off and be recovered. And then a fuel tank that would be thrown away. The fuel tank would power the engines in the shuttle orbiter. So it would uh, take off from the same pads that were used by Apollo. And um, there's a look at the other side so that you get a good look at the fuel tank. Uh, those solid rocket boosters, after they were used up, would fall away. And then you're up in space. And um, it turns out that the Russians developed their own shuttle. They thought, oh, well, you know, if the Americans gave a shuttle, we should have a shuttle too. And when they were, uh, what do you think of those two designs? Pretty darn similar, wouldn't you say? So they actually, during a press conference, so, so tell us, Russian uh, space program, why does your uh, shuttle look so much like the American shuttle? Oh, no, no, it's just aerodynamics and either just, it, the same kind of, no, no, they stole the plans. They literally stole the plans. Because we have an open space program, it was not terribly hard. 
Um, when the Russians wanted to develop their own supersonic transport to compete with the Concorde, they literally went to, they had trouble with the tires because the plane lands so fast. So they're wondering what the, uh, the French and the British did with their tires. So they literally went to the runway and got scrapings of rubber off the runway to see, but somebody noticed what they were doing, so they put gunk down, spy versus spy, and let them scrape up the gunk and take that back home and try to figure out what the heck they were doing. And this goes right back up there with the CIA stealing Sputnik 2. I mean, the spy versus spy stuff is, is amazing. But their, uh, their shuttle only flew once unmanned, and uh, the program flew into space. That's a photograph, that's an art. It was there to design the Russian, to support the Russian space station Mir, but this is art, it never happened. The shuttle was too expensive for them. You have to have uh, a wasteful economy like the Americans do, I guess, to run a shuttle program for as long as we did. They were actually, the, the, the Soviet leadership went to their rocket scientists and said, we need a shuttle. Um, and the rocket scientists said, but it's so expensive. But the Americans are doing it, the Americans are smart, so there must be a good reason. So we're gonna have one too. Um, I'm obviously cutting uh, a lot of uh, discussion there, but that, that was the heart of it. One of the other little known facts is the Russians were concerned that a space shuttle with that great cargo bay could go up into space and like James Bond, grab somebody's satellite and bring it back home. So they wanted that same capability as well in case the Americans decide to steal our satellites, we want to be able to steal their satellites. Yes, welcome to the Cold War. While that is art and that never quite happened that way, we never had a Russian shuttle and a Russian space station. We did have, and this is an actual photograph, an American shuttle on the Russian space station called Mir. And uh, Shannon Lucid is one of my favorite astronauts. She was on that mission. Jerry Lineger uh, from Michigan uh, was also served on Mir for a while. Uh, he was the astronaut when Mir caught on fire. He went to high school with my dad, as a matter of fact. Huh. That was a scary story. But we ran the shuttle. We ran over 100 missions of it. And then we decided uh, we needed to, you know, we had the ferries we've talked about a couple of times. Uh, the Russian shuttle never really worked out, so they kept doing Soyuz. This is still the same basic rocket they had from the 60s. Improved, kind of like the, the Beetle, 60s Beetle compared to a 2010 Beetle. I understand they're not making them anymore, but go with me. They carry them out by railroad. They tilt them over. They launch them up. The Soyuz capsule looks pretty much like what we had, and it docks to the space station. And uh, that's how we catch our ride now until such point as we are able to build our own uh, stuff. But between the shuttle and the Soyuz, we're able to build the International Space Station. It started like this 20 years ago. We're coming up on the 20th anniversary of the start of the space station. It has been continuously occupied for 19 years. We have been a true spacefaring species for 19 years. Not just visitors go up and go home like Apollo or go into orbit, do experiments, and come home. We've had people continuously on the space station for 19 years. The first part was the Russian module called Zarya, and then it was docked with the American module called Unity. And Unity, you might be able to tell from all those docking ports, is the heart to drive it all together. And the shuttle delivered that part. And that's where our program was born. So I want to talk about Soyuz a little bit and a hero of mine. I'm going to come back to this picture in a little bit. But this is Peggy Whitson. Peggy is, have you ever seen the movie The Right Stuff? This is an American astronaut with all the right stuff. Uh, she was, uh, she's been an astronaut now for, I think, 15 years. She was the head of the astronaut office. She was the astronaut's head astronaut. She was the commander on the International Space Station. Most astronauts don't even get to the space station because there's not enough seats to be not only good enough to get to the space station, but to be selected as the commander, should tell you what kind of person she is. She holds the American record for most spacewalks and most cumulative time in space. Mark Kelly, I'm sorry, Scott Kelly has the, uh, I get them confused, Scott Kelly, the twins. Scott Kelly has the most time and space in a single stand for an American astronaut, but Peggy has the most cumulative time. That's her in that helmet somewhere. And there's, there's another picture of Peggy touching the sun during a construction mission. When we talk about sending people to the moon and they talk about how the next person to step on the moon is going to be a woman, I will bet you $100 it's going to be Peggy. I'll bet you $50 my next guess is Sunita Williams. One of those two women, I think, are going to be the next Neil Armstrong. But this is even before we talked about this. I've had uh, a, a great big 
hero crush on Peggy for a while. And here's part of the reason why. Going back to that same picture. So here's Soyuz in three parts. There's the service module, rockets, oxygen, batteries. Um, this is the orbital module, so they have a little bit more room. This is where the cargo is. This is where they dock the space station. And this piece in the middle looks like a gumdrop is the landing module, heat shield here. So uh, they go to the space station, they dock, they do whatever they're going to do, and then months later they go back home. When they go back home, they uh, burn, they're about to uh, hit the Earth's atmosphere, they drop this away, they drop this away. I'm going to use props here. So not quite the right size, but pretend this is the orbital module and this is the, uh, the landing module and the heat shield's here and there's another service module here somewhere. So that drops away and then this drops away and then they come down and they land. Heat shield down. The problem was on Peggy's mission, this part didn't separate and they started coming in upside down. This is very thin aluminum. This is starting to melt and it was vibrating gyrations were enormous. In fact, um, cosmonaut, a Korean astronaut and Peggy, the Korean astronaut actually cracked a vertebrae. They're bouncing around so hard. And so they're bouncing around and then finally in the, in the violence of it, this tore away and it flipped around and they safely landed basically the last possible minute. And people asked Peggy, weren't you scared? Didn't you think you were going to die? It was, it was horrible, blah, blah, blah. Went, this is scary as heck, right? No, 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 no. It was just slightly less than nominal. Slightly less than nominal. I hope she's the next woman on the moon, the next person on the moon. And that's before I knew we were going to send somebody. So we built the space station and uh, maybe had a few minutes to enjoy the Earth. Um, we're now planning our next missions to get to the space station beyond. This is the Boeing spacecraft. Uh, there's also a company called SpaceX you might have heard of that is launching. Um, that's the Falcon rocket with the Dragon capsule. That's launching today. In fact, it was supposed to launch at 6.30 today. The next Falcon rocket, Dragon capsule, bringing supplies to the space station. That comes up and they grapple. And they're building a human rated version. That's Tony Stark standing next to that uh, crew dragon. Well, not really Tony Stark, but the closest thing to a real living human, that's Elon Musk. He owns Tesla Motors. He owns SpaceX. He's a billionaire. Um, he wants to go to Mars. If somebody, if I told you I'm going to Mars, you might, okay, that's fine. You might not, don't make direct eye contact and back away slowly. <laughs> He's kind of crazy. He's a billionaire with a rocket company that has been very successful at launching stuff. He wants to go to Mars. I think he's going to do it. He wants to go to the moon. I think he's going to do it. I think there's a good chance he's going to beat NASA at getting to the moon. I'll take that bet too. Um, he has a new rocket called the Falcon Heavy and as a stunt, he took one of his, Tesla, his own personal Tesla car, cherry red, and launched on the top of the rocket past the orbit of Mars just to prove this rocket works. Uh, NASA has what they call a dummy load. They'll put water or sand or concrete or something because you need to have some weight at the top of the rocket to prove its performance. But instead of just sending dirt, he sent a Tesla. It is a publicity stunt. It is only a publicity stunt, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Uh, it was just after the passing of David Bowie. He was actually playing Starman on the speakers. Not that you could hear it because, you know, vacuum, space. Uh, on the screen it says, don't panic. Those of you who read Douglas Adams, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It needs fuzzy dice, but it didn't have fuzzy dice. <laughs> it really needs some fuzzy dice right here, I, I think. That would have been, or maybe there was there and it fell off during launch. Uh, but he wanted to prove the Falcon Heavy worked and it had all the thrust. And yes, I can launch stuff to Mars. And it actually went past Mars into the asteroid belt. Uh, so there's a Tesla. In fact, I have the software on my observatory equipment where we can track where it is. I should find out where it is now. I think it's on the way back out of the asteroid belt and coming back to Earth's orbit. Um, I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. He's going. So we have the space station and we want to go to the moon and Mars. Budget is a real challenge. Um, that might be a way around it. But we've been developing a lot of new rockets to get us there. Uh, we've been talking about uh, Elon Musk. His next rocket is called the BFR, which you know, it's kind of a, a, a Silicon Valley bleeding edge company. BFR used to stand for big freaking rocket. That's not where I stood for. That's, so now once they, that's what you can do when you're, you know, you're just in your own in, inner circle. 
But once you actually kind of go public, you can't call it the big freaking rocket anymore. So it stands for Big Falcon Rocket. But so now when they talk about Big Falcon Rocket, you know that's the second name yes. that it's had. Um, Blue Origins is uh, Jeff Bezos' company, and he's building uh, monster rockets as well. NASA's working on the SLS here and here. These are the moon rockets from the 60s to give you a sense of comparison, U.S. and Russia. Uh, China is dreaming as well, but until I see hardware, I don't believe it. Um, NASA has spent $50 billion in 15 years building this rocket, and it's still not done. And um, I've had this saying that I don't count my, uh, my launches until they hatch. Uh, I won't believe that NASA is going to build a monster rocket that's going to send people anywhere until I actually see one launch. It's, it's been, I, I think I talked, I groaned about this last week. It was supposed to originally launch in uh, 2009. You might know us as 2019. Uh, just last week, uh, James Bridenstine, the head of NASA, uh, said, if, because right now the, it was supposed to be 2020, he said, no, no, 2021, but I mean it this time. <laughs> Any reason in particular for some of the delays? No? Congress, if you want a one word answer, not enough money and the money goes to the wrong places. And, um, it goes, to, it's, it is the worst possible example of pork. So it's not exactly or exclusively technological? Not exclusively. I mean, we built this in eight years, knowing nothing. We went from, can we even chew in space? <laughs> can we, can, do eyeballs even work in space? John Glenn, Al Shepard, from there to landing people on the moon in eight years. 15 years, and we're still working on this one. So, but that was when NASA was 5% of the budget, and this is when NASA is one-fifth, uh, one-half of a percent of the budget. Other programs, you might, uh, uh, Richard Branson, I think the handsomest billionaire on the planet, is working on Virgin Galactic and its uh, uh, system, and that's um, going to be sending its first passengers up, I'm going to guess, in September. And I'm guessing Richard Branson's going to be on, on board. But the Vice President uh, Pence, as well as uh, Jim Bridenstine, direct, NASA's director, talking to Space Station NASA, saying there needs to be a sense of urgency. We need to do this. So we have been working on this program and different ideas for it, like I said, for 15 years. And now these photographs are a bit dated uh, based on changing plans over time. Part of the problem is we change administrations, we change plans. Uh, this originally started under George Bush the Younger. And then President Obama canceled portions of it because it wasn't being funded. It was way over budget and way behind schedule. And President Trump has brought it back. And we'll see. But if this is successful, then we'll have a Starbucks in every corner. We'll have busking. And, you know, we'll get those old rovers working again. But then we'll have this. Ignition sequence start. We have taken tremendous steps. We choose to go to the moon before this dictator's out. We have achieved the earth shaking, the breathtaking, the groundbreaking, and left a mark in the heavens. Our successes build one upon another and amplify what is possible. The dawn of Orion. It's time we take the next great leap. We're building the next chapter of American exploration, returning to the moon to stay, so we can go beyond to Mars to expand what's possible and further our understanding. The architecture for these missions is already taking shape. We will go with new systems, bold designs, and a sustainable mission. You can hear it, taste it, touch it. We are going. We are training, testing, pressing our pioneering spirit into every component, defining our resolve with every line of code, and securing our success with every welcomed partnership. This is not hypothetical. This is not about flags and footprints. This is about sustainable science and feeding forward the advance of the human spirit. 
because we are the pioneers, the star sailors, the thinkers, the visionaries, the doers. And because we stand on the shoulders of giants to go farther than humanity has ever been, we will add our names to the roles of the greatest adventurers in history. Every day, every mission, we advance this call. We are NASA. And after 60 years, we're just getting started. I work for NASA. I'm a NASA educator. And I'm supposed to go out here and fly the flag. And it's easy to do because NASA's done some amazing things that I think will be remembered for hundreds or thousands of years. On the other hand, it's big government bureaucracy. And we've screwed up in some amazing ways as well. I feel that there's a real good energy developing in the program. Uh, not when I say the program, not just NASA, but other countries and other companies. Uh, I think we're going to see some changes. I think we're going to see some amazing changes in the very near future. Uh, I've been doing presentations like this since George Bush Sr. And put Dan Quayle in charge of the project to get us back to Mars. As I've heard this song and dance a lot, I think this time it's for real. Um, I hope to see one of you kids on Mars. Uh, come to the planetarium. The new Capcom Go story uh, we have in the planetarium is great. Um, I'm in the observatory. I'd love to see you there as well. Uh, every Friday and Saturday night, and also the first Sunday of each month uh, during the afternoon for sun viewing. I'm on the radio on WNMC. <laughs> Uh, every Friday morning, and you can catch it on iTunes. And that's it, guys. Thanks for coming. <laughs>